Okay, now, um, <clears throat> the first thing I'll, I'll do here really doesn't have much of a message behind it, other than um, somebody said they really wanted to see it again. Who was here last night? Oh, so some of you haven't seen this. This is so cool. Okay, just don't do it at home. All right? Okay, um, so I, I like doing illusions a lot, and that's kind of tricking the mind and everything like that, but I actually like doing science too, okay? So this is a science thing, and it looks really cool. Okay, ready for it? Here we go. My lighter goes. Was that cool? Yeah. Okay. I, no, I did it last night. I did it again today. That's it. <laughs> So that was just for you, right? There, no. <laughs> All right, um, well, I did bring some friends with me. Would you guys like to meet my friends? Oh, good, okay. I brought my pet tarantulas, okay? And... Do you see them? Is there anybody? No. No, no, I'm messing with you. I didn't bring tarantulas. I really didn't, know. Uh, <laughs> what I brought, um, I brought this little thing. And uh, I brought my friends, and they're actually three balls. Pretty good, huh? Okay. All right. Well, th these guys have names. All right. We have Mr. Green Beans, Mr. Yellow Pants, don't ask, and Mr. Redhead. Okay? All right. And uh, they actually ride a bus together to work. And uh, even though uh, it sounds kind of strange on this bus, they actually do have assigned seating. All right, so Mr. Green Beans, he's supposed to have the first seat. Then Mr. Yellow Pants, don't ask. Uh, and then Mr. Redhead, okay? All right, now I will tell you, one of these guys is a little bit of a troublemaker, okay? So you gotta help me out and see if you can tell me who. All right, so they ride on the bus just like that. That doesn't look quite right, right? No, okay, let's try this again. All right, so we have Mr. Redhead, Mr. Green Beans, and Mr. Yellow Pants, don't ask. Okay, all right, so we have Mr. Green Beans, Mr. Yellow Pants, don't ask, and Mr. Redhead, and they're right on the bus together. And <sighs> you can kind of figure out who the troublemaker is, right? Red. All right, well, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Redhead. Mr. Redhead is kind of a lonely guy. Um, doesn't tend to have a lot of friends. He likes to kind of push people around. And he, he's not one of those guys that naturally draws people to him. And uh, so when they ride on the bus together, even though Mr. Green Beans is supposed to have that front seat, and Mr. Yellow Pants, no, don't ask, and Mr. Redhead, right on the bus, he always pushes them and shoves them and doesn't say the nicest things to them. Well, finally it got so bad that Mr. Redhead had to go to a special place, and it's called Time Out over here, okay? So they figured this would solve the problem, and uh, so he wasn't allowed to ride the bus for a while, he had to figure out his own transportation and all that stuff, and uh, so Mr. Green Beans and Mr. Yellow Pants got the whole bus to themselves, which is pretty good, I, I think so anyways. Um, so they're riding along, and, and now Mr. Redhead, just a second, Mr. Redhead, you, you know the sign thing here? Yeah, and it's not nice to call people names like that. No, it's really not. No, you've got to stay here. Do you know what he said? Nothing, he's just a plastic ball. <laughs> so yeah, Mr. Redhead, you got, no, you can't go over there. No, you've got to stay here. No, Miss, you've got to stay, oh dear. Where'd he go? I You go here? He just doesn't learn, does he? Well, one day, one day, what happened, and it was cool we had the video at the start, one day, somebody took a chance and invited Mr. Redhead to church. And Mr. Redhead heard about a guy named Jesus. And he heard about a guy that never sinned, never did anything wrong, but Mr. Redhead didn't feel that great about himself. He knew he had done some bad things in his life and made poor decisions. But he heard about this guy that did nothing wrong and in order to take and get rid of those wrong things that he had done, he died on a cross. He took all that punishment and pain so that Mr. Redhead, if he came to Jesus, believed in him, accepted the gift of salvation, asked for forgiveness of his sins and turned away from them, he could be forgiven. And you know what? All of a sudden, people started noticing little changes about Mr. Redhead. 
he actually was a little more courteous and everything. And in fact, when they all would get on the bus together, Mr. Redhead was first in line to let them go first. And the cool part is that as Mr. Redhead rode the bus and Mr. Green Pants, Mr. Green Beans and Mr. Yellow Pants, don't ask, rode the bus with Mr. Redhead, he started sharing with them some of the things he learned at church. And before too long, these guys went to church with him too and started learning about what Jesus had done for them and not how they could have a new life in him with forgiveness of sin and promise of eternity in heaven. So that's the story of Mr. Green Beans, Mr. Yellow Pants, and Mr. Redhead. Give them a round of applause. And I believe at this point you are dismissed. All right. Um, now, I, I was uh, asked to come and kind of do a presentation. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. I um, <laughs> um, was asked to come and do kind of a presentation to um, demonstrate different ways to share the gospel and things that we need to keep in mind as we're sharing the gospel. Um, and one of the ways we're going to do that is you're going to learn some different tools, as Pastor John mentioned them as being, um, you can use to share the gospel in some creative ways. Now, I, I do work full-time with a bunch of youth, and uh, the youth really enjoy when I do the illusions and those type of things, because um, I like to use them as object lessons. But I understand with them, for some of them, they could care less about learning any of this stuff. They want to know how it's done, um, but they could really care less about learning it, because it's not their way, not their niche in sharing the gospel. And that's okay, because God has gifted us with each different talents, abilities, and ways that God leads us in how we can share the gospel with people. So if in doing this you're like, oh, I'm never going to use it, that's fine. It's okay. But, you know, if maybe for you, you're somebody that likes to write letters, and you're very eloquent in doing that. Or maybe you're one of the major Facebook, you know, people that, you know, constantly on there, and you can use that format to share the gospel. Or maybe you're just a really good cook. And for maybe your next-door neighbors, you cook a meal, you take it over to them, and you start putting your foot in the door to start sharing with them the hope that you have in Christ. Um, so we are going to show some things. So what I'm going to encourage, it's not that I'm trying to hide anything off to the sides. Uh, I'll be very honest and fair about that. But I want to make sure everybody can see what is going on. So um, if you're kind of off in the sections here, the more you can congregate towards the center, uh, the better it will be for you. Plus, you'll be uh, practicing some of this with the person that's sitting next to you. Um, so having a partner would become uh, very valuable to you as well. So if you wouldn't mind, it's okay. I'm pretty sure everybody showered in underarm deodorant and all that. Uh, but the closer you come in, the better chance you're going to have to see what's going on so you understand exactly what's happening. Um, once we get all that move made, uh, there are some ropes that are going to be handed out, um, along with everybody hopefully can get two sheets of paper. Uh, no, we're not doing the napkin thing we did last night. Uh, but one of your sheets is if you'd like to take notes, and the other one, uh, we're going to teach you how to share the gospel using just a sheet of paper. Uh, so if you don't have a pen, um, you're still able to share the gospel. So uh, we'll get these uh, passed out here. <clears throat> and while, while that's going on, I'll explain a little bit. Um, a lot of people wonder how I got into this, you know, what, what is the backstory? story? Um, I, I was blessed with growing up in a Christian home. Uh, at the age of five, I came to the understanding of my need for Christ, the fact that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. Um, I heard a message at church that talked about uh, hell, but also how we had sinned against God. And uh, I had a lot of questions. And my parents were very quick to answer them. And uh, so at five years of age, I came to the Lord. Also around that time, I uh, was wa watching uh, TV. And uh, David Copperfield was a huge thing. And uh, so I watched him. And uh, illusions, I thought that was the best thing going. Um, so I wanted to learn how to do it. So I went to the library and actually, to this day, if you want to know where to find the best tricks, uh, they're in books. And the reason they're in books is because nobody will take the time to read the books. So you want to learn the best stuff, it's actually in the books. Um, but then there's a place called Delta Lake Bible Conference Center in Rome, New York. And uh, I was actually there for my first family camp four days after I was born. And uh, there for different youth camps and all that. And I met these guys who went by magicians. Um, but they used the illusions to share the gospel. And that was a huge revelation to me that I could actually do that, of using it as object lessons and those type of things. Um, so as we get into this, one of the comments I'll make 
Some of this what you learn. You may choose not to use it to, to demonstrate the gospel. You may use it to get someone's attention. And more often than not, when I'm doing illusions and getting into a conversation with somebody about the message of the gospel, I'm using the illusions to get someone's attention, to just be that icebreaker that gets me through the door. Um, so there are multiple ways you can use this. But also, if you want to learn more, or even you may forget how one of these works, if you go to the library, um, most books actually contain what I'm going to show you today. Um, but you can learn other ones that are just excellent ways to start a conversation with somebody. So there are a few different ways we can look at this. So um, while those are being passed out, um, what I uh, have up here, um, I, I brought this uh, sheet of paper. And uh, it has the word sin on it. And if I keep track of where I dropped my lighter, um, this is kind of a simple thing um, that you can do as a demonstration. There's lots of different ways to utilize it. But in our lives, we all have an issue of sin. Sin is a problem for every single person. The Bible says all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God because of one man's sin. Through one man's sin, sin and death entered the world. Through another man's sacrifice came life, and that was through Christ. So if we have sin in our lives, because God is holy, he is loving, and, and a lot of people, when we are trying to share the gospel, will say, you know what, my God's a loving God. You know, God is a loving God, and he wouldn't send anybody to hell. Well, they're right in a point. God is a loving God, but the God they're talking about isn't in the Bible, because yes, he's loving, but they forget about the fact he's holy, just, and righteous, and sin can have no place in his presence. And so that is the problem. So if we have sin in our life, and God views us in that, he rightly will judge us and send us to hell. And that's where hell comes in the picture. But God desires that no one should perish, but all may have eternal life. And his gift through his son was the shedding of Christ's blood to cover our sins. So, make a mess on here. Again, this stuff does not have to be perfect. But he shed his blood to cover our sins. And so, when we stand before God, and God now looks at us, if we are in Christ, he sees us through the blood of Christ, and it's just the sins never were there. We're washed clean. We're made white as snow. Well, you see, Jesus was the light of the world. And he came into the world. To remove sin from our lives by the shedding of his blood. So that, oop, I got a little bit over here, but then there. All right. He came into the world to make us white as snow. So when we stand before God, he sees us as spotless, as blameless, because we're allowed into a place based on who we know, that being Christ, that otherwise we wouldn't belong. And that is why Christ came to forgive our sins so we could stand right before God, being made white as snow. Um, how this works, quick explanation. There is a really cool uh, product out. You just go to um, Staples. Uh, Walmart, I think, has them too. Staples where I find them most often. Uh, some of your kids may have these. Uh, they're called friction pens. Um, and what they are, they're a heat-sensitive ink. Um, so you can put it on the page, and then the back side of the pen has this nice little uh, rubberized thing. And so if you rub over top of it, it creates some heat on the paper, and it makes the ink basically turn invisible. Um, so what would happen is if I stuck this in a freezer, it, uh, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's fairly cold, 14 degrees, I think, um, the ink will actually come back on the paper. So that's kind of a cool thing that way. Um, but you can do this up. There are so many different ways. Um, I had one group that I actually had them all write different sins down on the paper, and then same thing, took the lighter to it. Um, I colored a paper with both a black pen and then with a regular um, black, well, one of these black pens and then a regular black pen. And so that way, whatever was in this pen would vanish when I put heat to it. And it was a big black spot. And same thing, Jesus was the light of the world. And when I did it, it spelled the name of Jesus out because all the black disappeared that had filled in the letters of Jesus. So there's lots of different ways you can utilize it. But if you have just these pens in your pocket, again, you could sit with somebody at a table and just write this out, and then you start carrying a not that you smoke, but you carry a lighter with you, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, 18 years older, um, and and you can do that, and it's just a neat little way. Um, why I would suggest using illusions or something visual 
is if we read in the Bible a lot of times, I, I really believe when Jesus was giving the parable of the sower and the seeds, and you know, some seed fell on good ground and it grew up, and some seed fell on the rock and it sprung quickly and then died, and some grew in the thorns. Um, there was a Jesus movie that, it may actually be the Jesus movie, uh, that came out, and I loved it how they demonstrated there was some seed laying by there and he picked it up, and he was throwing it on these different things. It was an object lesson, and God gave parables numerous times of these stories. Um, some scholars think some of those stories actually happened. He just was inferring real-life instances to help teach a biblical truth. Um, it's a good way to do it. Sometimes we share the gospel verbally so often that that's just it. People are just hearing it, but that visual aspect of your words coming to life can actually be the difference between that light bulb going off and going on and not. Um, so it's just something to think about, but a simple, simple way um, for a few bucks that uh, you can carry something in your pocket and quickly share the gospel with someone. Um, so everybody's got their paper now, right? I'm hoping. Okay. This is, um, I was sharing this with Pastor John this morning, and I'll have a few of you come up to uh, help me just to hold some pieces here. Um, if you're ever in a situation and you have a sheet of paper that is roughly this shape, a letter size, it can be smaller. I've done this with postcards. You have everything you need from point A to B to share the gospel with somebody. And again, we want to be clear because sometimes people are quite confused as far as what the message of the gospel is. And uh, what I'll generally do is if I have a pen too, I'll write it down. But I'll talk about God's law. And with God's law, we have offended it. So you ask the question, you're familiar with the way of the master. Have you ever told a lie? And, you know, again, something to throw out here because I know this can happen too, is that when we're witnessing... Um, I know we hear the Ray Comfort way of doing it, and generally, most often, we hear it that way. Have you ever told a lie? And the person's like, oh, yeah, I've told a lie, and what does that make you? We need to also remember, and, and I love the way Ray Comfort does it, and I do it that way very frequently. And even Ray Comfort says when you catch it, there are sometimes you change up the way that you share the gospel depending on the person you're talking to. And a lot of times, what I mean by that is this. When I'm witnessing something, I can tell they're all defensive. I can say, listen, all I can do is tell you this. I know the changes God made in my life. You see, I realized that I had lied. And according to the Bible, if I lie, I'm a liar. I know about myself that I have stolen things. And in fact, if I've lied, I've stolen the truth from somebody. Somebody once said that to tell a lie is to create a world of imagination and force people to live within it. And, and I offended that way. And I also know about me, I'm in huge trouble because I have never kept God number one. I mean, what about you? I mean, have, has, have you seen that in your life? And I feel horrible about that. I felt horrible about that. And I realized, and, and again, if you use this as mentioning the Ten Commandments, and I'll do this first and then I'll walk you through it. I realized that when it came to God's law, that I had broken every single one of them. And in truth, if you look at all Ten Commandments, by breaking one, you really do break all of them. And that's found in James chapter 2, verse 10. It says, if you break so much as one of these commandments, you've broken the whole thing. Because if you've lied, you haven't kept God number one. If you've lied, you haven't kept the second one because you've allowed yourself basically to become God in that situation and say, God, I'm not doing it your way. And, and it moves on down through there. But because of that, disobedience and breaking God's law I sinned against a holy and just God, the God that created the whole place. And there's a separation that exists between me and God. And if I can have the four of you just stand right up here real quick. You can set your papers off to the side. Just you're right here. You're real quick for me to grab. You see, the Bible does talk about a very real place. A lot of people know it to be more. You can just face everybody this way. There you go. Um, all right. So I'm going to have you hold these two pieces like that. And then, if I get this open, there we go. All right, so just hold that and bring this hand over. Excellent. The Bible does talk about a very real place. And a lot of people know it more to be a swear word. And even when a Christian sometimes will talk about this, they're like, oh, you said a bad word. That happens to me with kids all the time. But you're going to hold that right under there. And then your other hand gets to hold this. There we go. Okay, so just like that. Okay? The Bible talks because of the separation between us and God. It says the wages of sin is death. And if we were to die in our sin and God judges us rightly, 
we'd be destined for hell. So I hope you can see that there. Okay. So again, you lay this out in front of them. You know, we broke God's law. He doesn't desire for anybody to go here. This place was created for Satan and the demons, not for us. But if we're in our sin, that which God hates, God hates the sin, he's going to have no other choice but to send us here because he is a good, holy, and righteous judge. Now, the exciting part about this is, is that God had a plan. And I'll usually ask them, you know, do you want to hear what the good part of the plan is? Because by this point, they're devastated. And, and really so. It's a concerning thing to think when you pass from this life to the next, you're not headed towards a good place. And his plan was this. He sent his one and only son from heaven down to earth. And you see, his name was Jesus. And you see, Jesus died on a cross as a sacrifice for our sins. So if we understand that Jesus was completely without sin, he was the perfect sacrifice, he died for sins past, present, future. If we believe in him, not saying, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I believe in Jesus so it changes, it affects my life. I believe what he said was true. I repent of my sins. I'm so sorry. I never want to go back to doing it again. Turn from that. Then I can be made new. I can be forgiven of my sins and come to a right standing with God. And if I do that, it means that I don't even have to worry about this at all. And you can have a seat. Give them a round of applause for helping me out here. And when you get to this point, sometimes we stop, and it's good to continue on to let people know. When it comes to the cross, Jesus died on the cross, but three days later, he rose again from the grave. He conquered our sin on the cross. He conquered the whole death had on us so that we could have lived eternally with him in heaven. And also it means we have a living, breathing Savior who is very much alive today and is preparing a place for us in heaven. So a simple gospel illustration with just a sheet of paper. Okay, so I'll walk you through this. I gave you two for uh, one reason. If you want to tear your paper right now, you can. Um, but some of you may want to just do kind of a pen mark on it. It's a very simple thing, easy way to remember. Okay, when you're doing this, um, again, if you want to write the Ten Commandments down, um, I, was, I, I wanted to get my bigger copies printed and I didn't have a chance to. Um, when I do this normally on stages, I have the whole Ten Commandments, a picture of them on front. And then on the back, there's actually a wooden cross printed out, so I know how to tear it, and the name of Jesus is on the cross. And so it's kind of a nice little surprise that way. Um, you don't need to go that far. Um, all you do, it's like making a paper airplane for the most part. You're going to take, doesn't matter if it's this corner or this corner, but you're going to fold your paper down. So you get something that looks like this, okay? All right, so all I did is I folded it right so it's straight to the other side, okay? The next easiest part to remember about this, okay, is you're going to make your home, okay? <laughs> so you fold this down, and it looks like a house, okay? All your folds always go to the inside, okay? So you have your one fold down, your other fold, so now you have your home, that's the easiest way to remember it, is you're going to make your home. The next way to think about it is this is all messy. This is not, <laughs> okay? You want to hide the mess in your home, you fold it all to the inside, okay? Now, most, um, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm the only one that has ever realized this, um, but I have never seen any of the other performers that do this do it. Um, generally, with most of the stories, they actually tear the paper twice. I didn't like that because when I'm saying, oh, we broke God's law, I wanted just one tear. With this, you can get one tear. All you do is once you have hidden the mess in your house, just fold it in half again like this, okay? So you really want to hide the mess, and so you get this nice little angle thing, okay? There's no good name that I can call this short of... The angle thing, okay? <laughs> All right. At this point, there's only one, well, there's two things you need to remember, actually. But one that's really important, because if you don't do it right, um, you're going to cry. <laughs> uh, this is why. I, don't try tearing from up here, because you're trying to tear way too many um, layers of paper. Turn it upside down. And what you're going to do is you want to tear straight down through here, okay? Now, I'm going to show it this way so you can see it. 
You want to tear straight down through here, which is going to end up giving you these loose pieces right here. Uh, and I'll tell you what to do with those in a moment. But what you definitely do not want to have happen is one, to not tear straight and come off through these folds right here. And most definitely, because this is your end with the cross, is you do not want to tear down and tear off here and tear this corner off. You will not get the cross that way. Because basically what, there we go, let's get this down. If you don't tear it straight, and let's say your tear all of a sudden goes off this way, which I had happen before, um, there, there's not really much you can do. Um, that, that was your middle <laughs> part of your cross. Uh, so, so just something to, <laughs> to keep in mind, you want to make your line straight down through. Um, so I'll show you what, what I'm doing. There was a move that I did as I got through. Is you tear down through the center, so I'll do it first, and then again, you're welcome to follow through if you want. As I tear down through, obviously at this point, once I tear that far, these pieces all right here become loose, okay? What you, all you want to do is once you tear that far, take these pieces, pieces, just fold it over and add it to this side, okay? Your longest piece is your cross. Your short piece, so God is greater than us. This is us. This is God, okay? Your bigger piece, that, that is um, Christ, is going to end up representing. All of this little stuff is what will spell out hell. So um, it, it becomes very evident once you open up your pieces you're going to have two angle pieces that are really short and stubby. That's your E, and then the little tiny piece that gets your little center line of your E. And then you have a second little piece and two straight pieces. That's your H. And the other two are pretty obvious L's, okay? Um, so if, if you want to give yourself a chance to open that up and look at it, please do so. And then I'll explain the cross part, because this is probably the trickiest part as far as opening it. Um, but... Uh, Again, I'll make it very easy for you. I just want you to see what that looks like. Okay? All right. Did everybody get it okay that tried for it? All right. Now I see your paper. It just You had to tear farther down through, it looks like. Because so, most of it's still stuck together. So it just would have been a little bit farther tear is all. Yeah. Okay. Now... Just moving on, if, if anybody needs me to go over this again, I'll be out at the table, and I'll definitely run through anything that I show you today. When it comes to your cross piece, okay, this is what you're going to do. You leave it folded, and of course, you heard me say it, you want to know the plan that God had. You see, we, mess, we messed up, but we didn't mess up God's plan. He had a perfect plan, and it was this. Now, if you keep that idea, you want to hide your mess, it, it makes this easy. If I open it like this, this looks all nice and clean. This, not so much, okay? If you have your fold face towards you, uh, or all this mess face towards you, when you take it, you have a nice arrow. So God sent his one, looks like a one, and only son from heaven down to earth, okay? Now, the cool part about this is, if you start opening it with not turning it like this, the J shows up the right way right to begin with. Okay, so there, there's, there's Jesus. Okay, it says one of his son, his name was Jesus. And then to get the nice little open, all you're going to do, you're going to get your finger behind here. You're going to hold the front part of the paper that's right, in, you know, facing the person you're showing it to. And then you just pull it and you get the cross. Okay. So it's just a nice little gospel presentation so, so now I know what's going to happen. You're going to take a bunch of papers, fold them up, and shove them in your back pocket. <laughs> that is fine. That is fine. Uh, I sat at one restaurant, and they had those uh, How Are We Doing cards. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a nice night outside sitting at the table. And the person I was talking to did. They started asking questions about the Bible and about the Word. And I sat there opening, doing this tear with this little index card. You've got to you know, use a little bit more force to tear one of those things. It's possible. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you tear it, and it, it just, the gospel presentation just gets laid out so visually. And you also know they're not doing the thing of like, oh yeah, it's the wah, 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 wah. You know, they're, they're not doing that because they're so engaged in what you're doing here. They're also listening to what you're saying. And uh, sometimes I've been able to bypass the whole seeing them zone out because they're engaged in what's going on in front of them. So again, I'm not saying this is the main way to share the gospel. Um, obviously, the truth behind it is. Uh, 
But uh, as far as if you're looking for something visual, something to kind of help somebody see exactly what you're talking about, um, two great ways to really do that, okay? So uh, you can save that. If uh, you want to fold your other sheet to look like what all the folds are, you could do that now before you forget. And you fold it all the way down, and then just do a dotted line on it where you're supposed to tear. So that way if you get home and you're like, oh, what was that fold? Um, you can do that. Now, okay, um, I, I don't want the whole thing to be just, oh, this is how you share the gospel this way. This is how you share the gospel. That way. I'm, I'm hoping that you also get something that uh, God speaks to you through his word today as we show some things. And uh, I'm, I'm going to attempt something. It, this truly is one of the most dangerous things I do. The nice thing was child's play compared to what we're about to do now. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to try this. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we need to understand when we're sharing the gospel, um, and again, uh, Pastor John mentioned the book that um, somebody got uh, there, God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life. Um, God does have a wonderful plan for your life. But there's something to realize in that. When we say God has a wonderful plan for your life, there needs to be explanation as to what that wonderful plan is. Because when some people are hearing the gospel, and this is why a lot of people are so offended by the Bible, so offended by Jesus, they're the, well, I tried Jesus and things just didn't work out and I walked away from him. A lot of them have heard God has a wonderful plan for your life and thought that meant they're never going to have any more troubles, no more trials. Um, they're going to have no problems finding jobs. They're going to you know, get money. It, it's all this, what we think of as our own version of a wonderful life. And they then impose that on the gospel. And then they're offended because it's like, well, I came to Christ. And he was supposed to make life better. He was supposed to give me hope. And now I'm, I'm without a job. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. And you know, what's the deal with this? this? This gospel isn't worth anything. And that is the problem to say God has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. His wonderful plan is to be glorified through you. And that may be in troubles and trials and persecution. And he even says, if you follow after me, you will have pain and suffering and trials in this world. So it's actually a promise we're going to have a rough life more than it is we're going to have a happy life. And whenever somebody says, well, God wants me to be happy, you ask them where that verse is in the Bible and you won't find it. Um, so something to keep in mind. We need to be careful when we're talking to people about the gospel to make sure we are speaking the truth of the gospel. Because if the truth is God has a wonderful plan for your life and it's supposed to be this easy life, and the gospel really doesn't work. Because right now, in other countries, you have people, for them to make a decision for Christ, they don't get to see their family again. Or they end up in jail. Or it costs them their life. So where's the wonderful pl plan from God in that? Well, the wonderful plan is, he did give them a hope. A hope that when they pass from this life to the next, and we have this same hope if we are in Christ, when we pass from this life to the next, we have a promise of a home that our Savior has went to prepare for us. To be with him for all of eternity. And on this earth, we have the promise that if we keep our eyes on him and we follow after him, that we'll bring glory and honor to him. What is the chief purpose of man? To bring glory and honor to God. That is God's plan. That is the message of the gospel. We need to be careful. So um, what I brought here, in this case, and uh, I've got to find somebody here. Uh, you look a little too willing. Uh, <laughs> Would you want to help me? Yes. See, it's always the person that looks away from me. It was so, birthday. Oh, oh, oh see, so you definitely got to come up now. <laughs> What's your name? Ellie. Ellie, Ellie, follow me on up here. All right, you can stand right here is good. Right here is good. All right, so um, again, uh, just rephrase, do not try this at home, okay? I'm not that bright, so this is why I get away with doing this stuff. Okay. <laughs> In this chest... Um, I have uh, some staple guns. There. Okay. All right. Now, Ellie, have you ever played Russian roulette? No. Okay. All right. Oh, this this will be a first. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have staple guns. Uh, one of them's loaded. No, not that one. That might be that one. Ooh. 
Let's see here. Yep, that's it. Okay, so we got the loaded one there. Okay. All right. So now we know which one's loaded. All right. Ellie, what we're going to do... Okay. Oh, and I brought, just, just so you get a better idea, I mean, obviously, uh, shaving them into wood kind of shows you the damage they can do. Uh, I, I'm not silly, so I bring a volunteer. All right, this is Mr. Balloonhead. Okay, Mr. Balloonhead, do you want to help us? Oh, yeah, he's excited. Can you tell? Okay. So, Mr. Balloonhead, yes. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. So, the idea is we don't want that to happen to me, okay? <laughs> All right. So, Ellie, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand here so you can't see because you're going to do something in a moment. Okay, Ellie, uh, I'm going to stand in front, and uh, that way I'll kind of block people. I want you to mix those up for me. Okay? All right, go for it. Do you do this thing? Yes. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. You're done? Okay. All right, so now, Ellie, um, you're going to make some choices. Okay? And the whole point of this is our choices have consequences. The choice to share the gospel has a consequence to it. The choice to not share the gospel has a consequence to it. The word usage that we use when we're sharing the gospel can have consequences, and we need to take this all into consideration as we share the gospel. Now, obviously, as we share the gospel, we trust that God is going to speak through us to that person. We may be there at the time that we get to see that exciting moment where the light bulb comes on and they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, or we may be the one that's just planting the seeds and watering, and somebody else is going to have that joy. But life is full of a lot of choices. And right now, your choices are going to have some consequences, okay? Um, <laughs> what I want you to do, and if this goes wrong, it is completely your fault, <laughs> is, is choose one of the four guns. That one. You had to choose that one first? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give this a try. Again, I should say do not try this at home. You can come over here. <laughs> you sure you want this one? <laughs> all right. Oh, okay, we're all right. <laughs> all right, so that was a good first choice. That was a good one. Okay. All right, Ellie. We've got three now. All right, we're doing good. All right, so far you're winning. <laughs> now why don't you keep that? Uh, number one, number two, or number three? Number one. So, so you would probably agree this should get more dangerous as time goes on, right? Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, ooh, that's loud. loud. Okay, we're good. We're good, Ellie. All right, so Ellie, you have a 50-50 now. <laughs> One's loaded, one's not. One, well, I guess this would be good, number two now, and this would be number four, but which one would you like to go with? Number two. Really? <laughs> All right. Oh, we're good. We're good. Okay, Ellie. Made a good choices here. Just to make sure... See, Mr. Balloonhead's really okay. So let's make sure here. Yep, there we go. Okay. All right, give Ellie a round of applause. <laughs> so our decisions have consequences. There is a very beneficial consequence to sharing the gospel. And the end hope of that consequence is that that person realizes their lostness without Christ and their need of him so they come to a right standing with him. The consequence of not doing anything, of not sharing the gospel, is basically we're telling people we really don't care. That, you know, we, we know, I mean, as Christians, we, we either really believe this or not, we know the end result of our life without Christ is eternity in hell. And when we do not share the gospel with people, we're more or less saying that we really hate them more than we love them. Um, there's another performer. He's a very devout atheist. Um, it's surprising the comments that are coming from him uh, presently, I'm, I'm still praying he comes to know the Lord, but he's very much an atheist. His name is Penn uh, Gillette um, of Penn and Teller. 
Um, Penn put out a video a number of years ago. Someone after his show uh, walked up to him and said, you know, I really enjoyed your show. Um, obviously, their show can have a lot of language and vulgarity and stuff like that. Um, but the guy was just very complimentary and said, you know, I really enjoy how much work you put into it and those type of things. And uh, he said, now I know you're an atheist, um, but I have a Bible here, and I'd really like you to take it. I encourage you to read it, and I know you may think I'm crazy, but I really do believe the truth that is in here. And he gave it to Penn. Well, Penn then has a YouTube channel. You can watch his videos as he rants on different things or talks about stuff. Um, and in it, you can tell Penn is just genuinely touched by this guy that gave him the Bible. He didn't force anything on him. He just said, here's a Bible. Would you please, please just take the time to read it? And, uh, I mean, he almost, in the video, it looks like he's almost to the point of tears. But he makes a very um, challenging statement as far as it comes to Christians. Because one of the big reasons he does not believe that there's a God, one of the reasons he doesn't believe that there's anything to the Bible, is because he sees the Christians that did not tell him about Jesus. He sees the Christians that don't talk to people and share the gospel. And his whole comment was, how much do you have to hate somebody if you believe that there's a very real God and a very real hell to not tell them about it? And so for him, now granted, there, there's some other excuses he has. But one of the biggest ones is, he doesn't see Christians that really believe in a real hell, so it can't be true. You know, they, they want to believe in God and all the nice stuff, but they don't want to believe in hell. And he understands it. You either take the Bible at the whole, or you don't take it at all. Um, and he's come out with a few other comments. Um, he's put a few Christian speakers to shame in public interviews, because it's almost come across he knows more about the Bible than the Christians that really should know. Um, so be praying for Penn. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping maybe someday I get a chance to meet him and talk with him. Um, but it, we should take that as a challenge. Our decisions have consequences. Who is around you that's not a Christian? You know, I'm, I'm okay with the idea of the friendship evangelism, but what tends to happen most often with friendship evangelism is we befriend them, and then we get close to them. Well, then we're worried about offending them, and we never share the gospel with them. So in one sense, friendship evangelism, how, how long does it really take to build a type of friendship to where you can share? And in all honesty, Ray Comfort says it, if somebody asks you how you're doing, They've already invested a little bit of care in you at that point. It just takes a matter of you doing the same. And it does not take long to share just a little truth of the gospel. You may not be able to get through the whole thing, but just planting seeds, planting seeds. Um, and again, another warning. Um, Pastor John and I were talking about this last night. Um, I, I study very broadly um, in terms of my, my profession as a performer. Because there could even be somebody here, and I, I know as Jim shared with me to somebody last night, you know, Christians aren't supposed to do magic, right? And I, I have to have a response to that. I, I have to have a defense, you know. Am I doing something I shouldn't? Or, well, and the truth is, I'm not doing magic. It's illusions. Um, I'm telling you I'm going to deceive you. Basically, when I'm telling you I'm an illusionist, I'm going to mess with you. And not everything is exactly what it seems. Um, but ideally, that means that I get to have fun, you get to have fun too. But I'm telling you up front, Everything's not quite what it seems here. And in truth, uh, when we talk about the three wise men, um, the term, they were three magi. They were magicians. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they were trained to be magicians under that term. So a lot of the biblical figures we look at, um, at points and celebrate, um, actually had the term magician in there. But magic in terms of the Bible, it's the deceiving to say, I have this power. I have this ability. If you ever think about it, um, the uh, magicians that Moses encountered in Egypt. Um, when uh, the magicians showed up, the whole reason the magicians were there is because they had to help all those idols out. Because somehow they had to make the food disappear and they had to show the God's power. That all came through the magicians. Okay? So there was a deceptive, a secret art, as it's actually phrased there. Now some of what I use are the same things that people use that are deceiving that way. But I'm telling you, no special powers, no abilities. It's just like taking the time to learn and study. And it is okay to then use that to teach the truth of the gospel because I'm telling you, it's not what you think it is, but there's an important lesson behind it. A lot of what you've seen is deception. And some of you have been fooled by that. It is so easy to be deceived. And you should know that by now. If, if I've fooled you on one, you should know it's very easy to be deceived. And we need to be careful because there are many variations of the gospel out there. Make sure in your studies, you're studying the one true gospel. You're sharing the one true gospel. But also, the good guys and the bad guys are no longer wearing the white and black hats. And there are, sadly, pastors in the pulpits that teach the Bible just as 
a good moral book and completely missing the message of the cross and of Jesus, and they're misleading. You see, Satan doesn't care what you believe, doesn't care what anybody believes, as long as it's not the truth. You see, with rat poison, 99% of rat poison is great stuff for the rat. It's the 1% that kills the rat. We have to be careful. We've got to be, as Christians, so I'm talking, yes, as witnessing Christians, is you personally, anything I say, anything Pastor John says, and I'm pretty sure he'll agree with me, and if he doesn't, then I'll get concerned. Um, but any pastor you ever hear, if it's on TV, really be careful of the TV ones, obviously, I'll tell you that up front. But anybody you ever hear speak to you, if they're speaking about the Bible, be like the Bereans. Check it out for yourself. Do not take my word for it. Never take anybody's word for it. You need to read the Bible. You need to spend time in God's word so you know the truth and you're not deceived because there is so much deception going on presently. And, and nothing new, but it's getting a lot more deceptive and, and mixed in with the truth where it's hard to tell what is what. Um, so be cautious. Be careful. Your choices have expounding consequences. All right. Um, Everybody's got their rope. I'm hoping. All right. Uh, Pastor John, do you want to help me out with this? I'll get you up here. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'll show you this. I will do my best to teach it to you. If you don't get it again, I'll be at the table. Um, as far as anything you're going to see this morning to share the gospel with, it, it's some of the complicated. Okay, this is the most complicated, Okay. It's easy, it just it takes a moment. So I guess I'll have you stand up here so they can see over here. And uh, we're going to end off with this one. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I appreciate if you come by the table, you buy stuff. Um, it helps me out. Um, but honestly, if all you do is come by the table and you just have questions um, as to how to witness better to somebody, um, I'm okay talking with that way. I mean, I'd love to sell you stuff, obviously. Um, but it's more important to me, um, really, I feel, to answer any questions you have. Um, concerning paranormal stuff, to witnessing, to whatever, um, but just, uh, just so you know that. Um, okay, so Pastor John, this is what you're going to do. Uh, now I only gave you one rope. You can try this along with us. It's okay. Um, and actually, it'd be good if you do, because it'll make it easier when I teach you. Um, but Pastor John, what I want to do, I'm going to teach you how to tie a knot in this rope without letting go of these two ends. Okay? All right, so you're going to take the rope, put side A over side B, through side D, outside around, flip it over the wrist like this, and you get a knot like that. Okay? <laughs> Okay, it was close. It was close. <laughs> Give me some fishing line. Uh, it's a fishing line. There you go. All right. So hold both ends like this. Okay. All right. You're going to take this end. You're going to drape it over your arm like this. So it creates a U. So hopefully you can see that, the U right here. Okay. I'm trying to get everybody so you can see. So you got a U. All right. Now, as you pull this end down, what I want you to do is pull it so it comes. So now you've got a line down the center of your U. Okay, now, this means you have two holes through your U. There's a hole right here and a hole right here, okay? What I want you to do, the hole that's closest to your body, keep holding on to the end of the rope, go through the hole closest to your body, wrap around that center rope, you're going to bring it out with you, and come back out the other hole. Yeah, you got it. Okay, you got it. Okay. It looks like the majority of people got it. This is good. Okay. All right. If you got, you're going to see this a couple more times, so keep trying it. But for most of you, you got it. This is going to make it so much easier for you to know exactly how to do this once I tell you. All right? So then, all you have to do, throw it off your wrist, and you end up with a knot in the rope, just like that. Okay. Well, now it will become evident that the reason you can't get the knot at this point is because I'm not telling you how to do that yet. But, all right. But uh, let, what you do with the person, you'd have them try it one more time. Same thing, because you need them to know how to do this whole rope maneuver, because um, it becomes important to the conclusion of the gospel presentation. But this side, over the arm, so you get a U. All right? You have your line going down the center of the U. You have the hole that's closest to your body. You're going to go in the hole closest to your body, wrap your wrist around that center rope, and come back out the other hole. So it should look something like that. Okay? All right? If you notice the person next to you is having a little trouble and you actually have it, you can help them out. Um, but I, I mean, I'm looking at the majority of people's hands and they have it, so this is good. All right. So then at that point, you ask them, okay, again, throw it off and you should get a knot. Oh, you didn't, you didn't get it. Okay, well, see, you know, I get a knot just like that. 
Okay, all right, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. Actually, I'm kind of messing with you because, you know, and the knot disappears like that. Okay, all right. Now, just to move things along, can you do that whole maneuver? Just get it all on your hands again. So over the you, in the one hole, out the other, right there. Okay, oh, well, I didn't ask you to throw it off. So, so just get it to the point before you throw it. Nope. Okay. So you get the U line, hold closest to yourself, outer hole, pull it tight. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> can, I, can I have the ends of the rope? All right. Can uh, you pull your hands out? All right. Pull your hands right out of the rope. All right. And it gets a knot just like that. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll explain this, but this, this is the point to this. Through this whole point, Pastor John has not been able to get the knot, and I know some, some of you could not get the knot either. But why this works as a gospel illustration, it's fun, it gets people's attention, it's kind of big because you get a good length of rope and people's hands are going all over the place. But as much as Pastor John kept trying, he could not get the knot in the rope. And it's the same way in our lives. Because of sin, we cannot be perfect, we cannot complete what we need to complete because we are unable to do it. Pastor John couldn't get the knot in the rope I was able to get it every time. And so for me to just for the moment take the position of Christ, I asked John something. Did anybody catch what it was? Can I have the ends of the rope? Okay. If the rope represents Pastor John's life, and he's not able to do that. You see, we needed somebody who was perfect, who was holy, who was just, to come on the scene. And I asked Pastor John, can I have the ends of the rope? Can I have your life? And in the same way, we need to hand our lives to Christ, and when we do that, he completes the knot for us. Okay? So this has an easy explanation to it. So I'll, I'll give this, believe it or not, if you, if you have the whole uh, initial part before you throw it off right, um, you've, got the re you've got the reason for this working. Okay? So when this comes over, I do everything exactly the way you are. You get the U. You get the line down the center. I go in the hole closest to myself. I come out the other. Now, this is the important part right here, okay? I tell him to throw it off. Again, deception does play a role when you're doing tricks. I say I never am going to let go of the ends of this rope. It's not entirely true, <laughs> okay? This is why, but it happens so fast when you practice it. As I'm doing this motion to toss it off, if you take your hand, you notice how this rope is going down to right here, and then it comes back on, around my wrist? You see that? Right there, this piece right here. Okay? All right, so I'm holding up here my fingers, but right here below, there's this rope. Okay? What you do to get the knot is as you do the tossing motion, I actually get these fingers to grip this. I let go of this. Okay? And as I'm coming off, I reposition position my hand down, and no matter what, you're going to get a knot in the rope at that point. Okay? Oh, and he lasted somebody. All right. <laughs> I don't know how to do that one. So that, all right. So I'll, I'll run through it one more time here for you. Thank, give Pastor John a round of applause. All right. So again, you go over your arm. You get your line down the center, in the hole closest to your body, out the hole farthest away. You have this top strand here, right below. Now, sometimes this can happen where it's back here. If that happens, just reposition it until you get your hands right, so now you've got this below to grab, okay? Then all you do, I mean, I do this in the whole throwing motion, but all I'm doing is I grip this, I let go of this, and everything comes off, and I get a knot, okay? Now, I don't usually give this part away, but if you want to mess with them, which I generally do like to mess with people, <laughs> all right, you do all this motion to get to here, okay? Everything's the same. But we had the knot that I had that all of a sudden was gone. This is how you do it. <laughs> all right? Do not let go of the ends of the rope at all. But this hand over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull, I'm going to stay holding on. I don't let go of anything. Stay holding on. I'm going to pull this hand out of everything first. And I'm going to pull it until it gets tight right there like that. Okay? All right. Now, at this point, I may sometimes have to use this hand to do it or I just shake it off but you pull this loop off like that, and still, I've, I've not let go of the two ends. So in this one, you do not let go at all. And then you get this little thing. Now, you don't let it hang here so they can see this happening, 
But while they're kind of messing and, oh, you didn't get it, you kind of pull it so it comes down to a point like this. So see, I got my knot right there. Well, all it actually is is a slip knot. So if I go, it just vanishes like that. Okay? Now the end part where I took the ropes from Pastor John, all you literally have to do is you take the ends from the person you're doing with it and the knot will tie itself. Okay? So if you, if you do all that, hand it to the, your ends to the person next to you. If they take them, you will get the knot. So the simple illustration is the rope represents our life. And God does require something of us. A lot of times we refer to it as the free gift of salvation. Not entirely accurate because it does cost something. It costs Christ's life, but it also costs us dying to ourselves and allowing him to take control of our life. So just a simple way to do it. Again, if you need help, catch me after. Um, let me pray for you, and we're going to let you go. And we're going to take an offering first, and then I will pray for you. Oh, I might be able to light that. I can try lighting it. Yeah, and again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm going to just quickly show you two items. We'll, we'll try and set that off. The problem is it's been set in a while, so I don't know if it'll go. Um, again, items on the table. Um, there are three items. I w there's two I was hoping to show today, and apparently that box vanished on me between here and home and here, so I think I left it at home. Um, but there are three items on the top of the pages out there. You can order them through me. I do not have enough here to sell them. Um, but one of them is this. Um, Somebody have a pen right in the front row real quick? Oh, come on up. Come on up. Okay. Um, easy to carry in your pocket. Um, you generally just ask the person what they know about the cross. Um, you then, oh, no, no, I'm going to use you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to use you. Yeah. Um, you. You then do need to have a pen with you, or hopefully there's a pen around you. But what you ask them to do is to write their name right in the pedestal of the cross there. So just so everybody can see, it's a business card with a cross and a pedestal. Just write your name right in the pedestal. And then uh, you'll, you'll take it so they have their hands free here. Uh, but it, it opens up the opportunity to talk about the cross. Can you lay your hand flat for me? You lay the card in their hand like this. They put their hand on top. And uh, at this point, they're doing something. You can continue on in your gospel presentation and talk about what Jesus did on the cross. And then at the end, you can ask them, do you know what he did for you? And you can respond if you know the answer. <laughs> you do, what did he do? He died for you. And see, open your hand. And they get to take this, but their name's on the bottom with the sign, he died for you. So again, it's just another, it's simple, but it, it's another little thing they can take with them. And remember that whole conversation they had with you, the gospel, with a card that says he died for you with their name on the bottom. So it's, again, the visual stuff can just help bridge that. Uh, give a round of applause. And then this... Uh, just a simple, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go through this real fast. Um, black box, black represents our sin. We were lost in our sin. And the fact is, because of our sin, we can have no place in, in the presence of God. And inside, there's a red box. And the thing to make sure that people know about this is that, uh, there we go, is that the black box does not fit inside of the red box. It just doesn't make it. Well, at this point, the red can represent the blood of Christ. And you say, you know, Christ did something for us. He shed his blood on the cross. And you see, in our sin, we're in trouble. But if we repent of our sin, turn, the Christ, turn to Christ, he covers us with his blood. And then, again, the whole concept, God views us through the blood of Christ. And that's where we become white as snow so we can be in the presence of God. So, again, little stuff in the pocket, very quick. Um, there's something called a hot rod if you want to ask me about that. Um, but it's all actually got all the colors of the wordless book, if you're familiar with that, where it's just the colors, and you can do that, and it's easy to carry in your pocket. So 
They're sim- everything out there is simple. There are a couple that require a little practice, but it's very easy um, to do. And then for Pastor John, hopefully this will work. Here we go. And no, I don't explain this one, so sorry. Let's see, we're going to go. Okay, it is actually doing it, and this is one of the silent ones. <laughs> You're not going to see anything, so I'm just going to set that back here. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's actually what could happen. So, um, I was loading that on my vehicle one time, and before I put it in, I always make sure it's clear. And uh, it started off silent like that. Once I put it in the vehicle, it went, and, you know, so, um, and again, when I say don't do this stuff at home, um, seriously don't. Uh, the, I use that as an explanation. I was doing a show outside one time, and it was for a church. And uh, if anybody saw the program last night, that happens in the first five minutes of my show. Um, there was a few factors that played into it, but the whole flame went completely up the backside of my hand, and I got second to third degree burns back here, and by the grace of God, you would never know. Um, I I can't even explain that short of God. Um, I actually proceeded to do the whole 45-hour show, um, and primarily because it was out on a street, and there were people I knew that hadn't heard the gospel. Um, But by the grace of God, um, I got that hand, and not all scarred up. So, um, Obviously, there's some things you can do. Other things, it's just lots of practice, and please don't try it at home. Uh, but let me pray for you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, again, uh, I am Illusionist GTC, which goes by giving to Christ. Um, and it's my desire that you're given to Christ. More importantly, it's his desire that you're given to him.